Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our Compassion Index webinar. Uh, my name is Laura Burgess, and I serve as a trustee for the Charter for Compassion, as well as um, leading the Human Values Center. And we have invited you here today, and we're delighted to have so many people from around the world. My understanding is we have more than 120 people on today's webinar to learn more about how to measure the impact of compassion. Our executive director of the charter, Marilyn Turkovich, uh, is not with us today, but I wanted to share just uh, a brief um, outline for folks who may be new to today's webinar who are not familiar with the Charter for Compassion or Compassionate Cities. The Charter is in its 10th year now uh, of bringing compassion to all of the major sectors of society to bring about more humane and more compassionate communities. We now have close to 500 compassionate cities around the world. And part of the reason that we've invited uh, our guests here today is to help those who are in leadership roles, volunteer roles, uh, city roles, those who want to understand the impact of compassion on their communities. We now have metrics available to us to demonstrate the way in which compassion is moving the needle and having a positive social impact on our communities. So we have with us today, Dr. Anna Fall, who is the executive director of the Institute for Sustainable Health and Optimal Aging. She's here from the University of Louisville, who many of you know is a city uh, that has been a leader in the compassion movement. Her colleague, Dr. Joseph D'Ambrosio, is the director of health innovation and sustainability. And for the next uh, 40 minutes or so, we are going to turn it over to them to share with us how they developed this compassion index and more importantly, how you can utilize this tool in your communities. Then we'll open it up for question and answer. So feel free to use your chat um, capabilities here to send in questions. We'll also record today's session. So this is being recorded so that it can be shared for those in different time zones and for those who had a conflict this morning. Okay, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Drs. Fall and D'Ambrosio. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Laura. Uh, welcome, everyone, to our webinar. Uh, we hope that you will learn something. We're going to take it slow, uh, take you through the slides and talk a little bit. And just yeah, feel free to ask us any questions in the chat. At the end, we're going to open it up for questions. So just write down all your questions as we go along. And now I'll just move to the next slide. So in 2011, the city of Louisville and their board signed the Compassionate Cities Charter. And at that time, we have our mayor, Greg Fisher, very much wanted to promote compassion in our city. And as you can imagine, many of the people in the city doubted whether we were a compassionate city or not. This claiming that you're a compassionate city is one thing, but then actually proving that you're a compassionate city is another. So the citizens of Louisville, a number of groups uh, formed around compassion and began to decide how are we gonna measure whether we are compassionate or not. And what they ended up doing was they contacted us to say, the two of you are researchers, can you help us develop an index that would measure whether a city is compassionate or not? So city compassionate city government compassionate actions coupled with citizen compassionate actions create a compassionate city. It's just not one or the other. You can have people who are compassionate, that's great, but the city needs to be doing something too. And what we'll talk about today is how we've combined those two uh, factors into an index. So <clears throat> they, there's a lot of definitions that exist that explain what compassion is. Uh, we have decided to, to focus on a definition that include actions that governments and citizens can take to make their city compassionate. We call these actions energy, 
that radiates outward from the government and its citizens. So it's like the sun shining down on that city. That's the energy we're talking about. That radiates from whatever the government and the city and 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 the people that live there are doing to make their city a place that they can feel compassion. So we decided to use the word energy because really those compassionate actions, that feeling that we have, that hopefully we're even sending our energy to all of you to excite all of you to begin to measure the compassionate energy in your communities. We've decided to use energy because that really symbolizes what's happening when you are compassionate. For this study, we define compassion as the alleviation of pain and suffering and the promotion of human flourishing. So it's really a two parts compassion definition. One can be compassionate by just trying to alleviate pain and suffering, but we wanted to go beyond that. We wanted to go to a place where we would actually help people flourish, no matter what condition they're in. So what is human flourishing? Human flourishing is the ability of people to live at their highest potential. And this means that we should be able to, wherever we are, whatever circumstances we live, we need to be able to function optimally and reach whatever goals and desires we have in life. And all of that is supported by government and the people that surround us. So that is what human flourishing is, and that is what our goal is, is to create that environment, irrespective of disease, irrespective of that, but uh, creating a, a, a really optimal life environment. So what, what's interesting is that in academia, there are so many definitions for compassion, so many definitions for flourishing. So we try to limit that to uh, what Anna just said and to try and say that no matter what condition you're in, no matter what level you're in within your society, that you should still be able to flourish. So an example, both Anna and I are in the health field. And one of the things that we try and do is no matter what health condition you're in, you should still be able to flourish. So even if you're in advanced stages of Alzheimer's, you should still be flourishing. You should not be locked in a room or discarded by society that this is our responsibility to each other to really make each other be the best that we can at every moment of our lives. Okay, um, now the first, the, the, the first part of our uh, index focus on internal compassion energy. Internal compassion energy is what we say is the focus of individual citizens to, to uh, to be compassionate, and that is if they are able to act with compassion towards himself and others, and in this process, promote human flourishing. So it's about what I do to Joe, what Joe did to me, um, what we do to each other, how we are promoting a life that I try to alleviate his pain and suffering, and he's trying to alleviate my pain and suffering. It's on that inter interpersonal level, it's about how good neighbors we are to each other, but how, how well we can uplift each other in our world that we live in. But it's really, it's not about just throwing some money in a, in a basket. It's really about, once again, it's about doing that, but it's also taking the next step. Engaging with the person. Engaging with the person. Being concerned about the person. Having that internal focus so that you understand what that person is thinking about and what that person really needs. So an example of internal compassion would be, I know that Anna loves classical music and I would want to, when I'm around her, to have her, to let her hear classical music, not, not rock and roll music, for example. Yeah, please not. <laughs> All right, so. Okay, so external compassion is what, what a city or a county or a government organization is doing. What are they providing? How, what are they providing to their citizens and how are they providing it? What are the services and the resources? So this is the other part. This is the external compassion energy where our government needs to be doing something for the citizens to promote human flourishing. And one of the things that, that we all know happens in society is that resources are not equally distributed. 
Um, and that's a problem for compassion. You can't claim to be compassionate if you provide certain people with resources and support and not others. So a very strong focus of this index is make sure that we see the social justice component also in our cities uh, and, and, and how well the cities are doing to um, overcome those disparities. Right, and, and an example of this is in the city of Louisville. So what our mayor has done within the city of Louisville, he actually has a goal of compassion that is integrated into everything the city does. So even, even the garbage collection, they have to say how they're being compassionate. So that would be the city's effort to promote compassion within all of their goals. Now, I think we should say that this index, the external index, the way we measured it is based on the United States and the data we have in the United States. But this can easily be adapted to any community yes. based on the resources that are being offered by the community. And, and based on the data that's available to look at that, yeah. So we're gonna take you now through the methods that we use to develop this index, and then we're gonna e eventually share with you some of the data from the label, just to give you a feel for um, what it looks like in real life and how that helps you then to do planning and to move towards more compassion. Okay, so um, what we've done is we use the social progress index. It is a global index that looks at um, how a society is progressing. Um, and we like the way that it's divided up in basic human needs, foundations of well-being and opportunities. So a lot of the work we did and a lot of the data we searched for would fit into one of these categories. Uh, not everything was applicable to us here in the state, so we did some ad adjustments, but that's the beauty that we see with this index, is that it's very really adjustable to whatever society you engage yourself with. So, okay, so the first, the first important piece is that the index is sort of the foundation comes from the social progress index. And, and what, what we did was, in trying to develop an index, there are so many indexes that are out there in, around the globe. And what we did was we looked at all of the indexes and said, which of these indexes could measure compassion the best? Right. And we felt that the social progress index, and then we'll show you our, our next index that we used also. And I think one, one point I wanna make uh, about that is that when we start looking at the literature and start seeing how people are measuring compassion, most of the time it's done with how much money uh, is given to volunteer, uh, well, it's, it's given to uh, uh, wealthy organizations and how many volunteerism is happening. And that to us is a very small part of a much bigger puzzle. So um, we realized that we need to elaborate more on looking at compassion in a much more holistic way. So we also looked at the Gross National Happiness Index from Bhutan. And this index was uh, used uh, by Bhutan to measure their happiness. Since, it, for example, the United States has the Gross National Product Index. So Bhutan said they didn't have the resources and they used this happiness index, which we found very applicable to measuring compassion within our city. Okay, so we followed the multi-level design when we decided how we're gonna do this. And it's sort of on a continuum of reality. It's a degree of reality that you see. On the one end, you get your objective contextual data that you collect from existing data sources. Um, to give you an idea of what the external compassion look like. That is the data that you gather from uh, city resources, county resources, government resources that give you a feel for that community. On the other hand, we've got the subjective individual data. That's our individual surveys and semi-structured interviews we did because we wanted to find out, one of the things we've learned is that uh, many times the poorer communities are labeled, are labeled as there's no compassion in these communities or, or there's just many times negative labels attached to that. And we wanted to see what's, this, what's the human capital across the city. Uh, because that's a very important, that's a very important part of our journey. Because many times your, your, 
deprived communities have very strong uh, neighborhoods, very strong support systems in place. And that is excellent because that means there's a lot of, of energy inside, in between people that can be utilized effectively when you get to the stage where you need to look at, okay, so look at your contextual data, look at your individual data. If it's not aligned, what do we need to do? How can we leverage the energy that sits within people to get the resources from the government that you are required to have and that you should have? So that is sort of the principle behind our design. And, and, and it really becomes a degree of reality. I, I, that, I think that's a great statement because it really takes both. It takes the people, the energy within the people, and the energy within the government. And we know we can measure the energy within the government from objective data and existing data source, sources. And, and we can get the rest from the people. We can get the rest right from the people. And then you need to make sure you are very representative of the people that you are looking at because you need to know really how everyone feels in the city. And that is always the challenge and we'll, we'll get to that a little bit more. So let's just take you quickly now through all of the domains that forms part of our external compassion energy. So we have three things. The basic human needs is uh, one thing that we are missing. It's got three categories and 11 indicators. We have foundations of well-being that has five categories and 16 indicators. And then under opportunity, we have two categories and six indicators. And we're going to take you through each one to give you a feel for what are we looking at. And now remember, this is what was applicable for us in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, and it, that I think for the most part, we try to think of things that could be applicable anywhere where we are. So for nutrition and basic medical needs, we looked at food access to grocery stores. So in the United States, that's supposed to have so many resources, we have food deserts. And even in Louisville, Kentucky, which is fairly a small uh, geographic area, we have food deserts within our city where people uh, don't have access to food. They, they need a car, they need, or they need to walk or take public transportation to get groceries. And then whether people have health insurance or not is another one. Uh, shelter is the next one. Uh, here in the States, if you uh, are paying more than 30% of your income for housing, you are seeing as, as house insecure. And that means that you don't have enough means to uh, get yourself into a safe environment where you can uh, live. Uh, home ownership, we feel it's important to look at the ability to provide everyone the opportunity for home ownership and to have lack of homelessness in your community. And then the other important factor is personal safety. So we looked at lack of homicides within the neighborhood, lack of violent crime, lack of property crime, lack of fatal crashes, and average speed limits. The next one is the foundations of well-being uh, domains, of which the first one is access to basic knowledge. And here we look at the rate of high school graduation, 25 plus in the community and the pre-K enrollment to make sure pre-K enrollment really is just going to preschool so that you get some of that basic education early on. And then access to information and communi communications. We have many areas in the uh, United States that don't really have good internet access, but being able to have internet access and provider access. And then we take it the next step, what is the maximum download speeds? When you're doing searches on the internet, how, can you, how fast is the download? And then maximum advertised upload speeds. So that information is available to us and it also brings people together via the web. I think the other part, I just want to mention as a side note to this, is that uh, I moved from a city environment into a rural environment in Kentucky, and the lack of internet access for me and to be able for me to do my job is pretty amazing. And I've never experienced this as much as what I'm experiencing it now. And you see the, the disparity that immediately come in there if you do not provide 
quality access to resources. And for us here in the States, it's really access to the internet, access to information is really important. And the speed of downloads. And, and because, you, yeah, it's really Because important. now you, you have terrible speeds. I have terrible speeds. I can barely it's download. difficult to do research. I can almost do nothing at, at my house. Yeah. So the next one is health and wellness. Um, that is to have a life, ex what is the life expectancy at 60 years of age to see how well or, or, or bad that is. And if it's across the city, the same. Premature deaths from non-communicable diseases, disabilities, physical healthy days and mental healthy days are the things that we are measuring in terms of health and wellness. And then external compassion, energy domains, foundation of well-being, we look at environmental quality. For the United States, for our area, we looked at the days not exceeding ozone standards, the tree canopy, and then vacant housing. And then access to basic wellness opportunities is transportation access, lack of unemployment, and not living below poverty. Those are the basic wellness opportunities that we felt were very important to investigate. Now, you know, I, I think we should also say that this may change depending on where, where we are. Yes, it, so it on does. different parts of the different parts of the United States and different parts of the country, and this could be adapted. Yes, it really depends on what is available and what makes the most sense for your environment. Uh, but this is this this gives us the framework to work from. This is an example of what we did for Louisville. Um, opportunity is tolerance and inclusion. That is the one I, I talked about earlier on that most of the time are the only thing that's been looking at when you look at is the city compassionate, is the giving ratio and the median contributions that is provided to um, welfare organizations and certain forces. And then access to advanced economic opportunities. What are the per per percentage of graduate or professional degrees? What's the labor force participation? What is our income? And what's the gender wage gap? Yeah. Okay, so those are the external compassion energy sources. And we use all of these uh, data sources that you see up here is what we use to get to um, this data. We use the US Census Bureau. We had some local data we looked at. We looked at some state data. Um, it's just a lot of data sources that we used to and then brought everything together into one system. And this, as I, as Joe said earlier, that, that this will change depending on the area that we will be looking at. Yeah, so we're, we're, we're rather lucky in the United States because we do have a lot of data. And uh, like, for example, Louisville has a, a Metro open data portal that the police department has. So we actually were able to go in and find out specific data from our city. Kentucky has homeless management information system. The National Tra Transportation Highway uh, program has data that we were able to get. So it was fairly easy for us to collect this data. Although it did take some I, time. I, I would not say easy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now in terms of internal compassion energy indicators, we looked at, um, and this is work that Joe and myself have done over many, many years. Um, actually, uh, way back in 2010, uh, Joe developed a work related to compassionate love. And uh, do you want to say something? Yeah, about sure. That? So w one of the things that, that has always plagued me as, as a human being since I was a little child was why is it so hard for us as human beings to love one another? And that question led me to do dissertation, uh, my dissertation on whether people can actually show love towards one another. And one of the ways that we felt and we learned from doing our research was that you really have to have number one, self-compassion and you have to be able to show empathy. And that leads you to compassionate love. So once again, when I said that there's different definitions of compassion, this is one of those di differentiations that compassionate love is that combination of compassion and really promoting that human flourishing. You want to say something about the five dimensions? If you look sure, at sure. So one of the other things that we looked at in compassionate love was how do you operationalize compassionate love and compassionate love According to the writings of Pitterim Sorokin, who was a sociologist uh, back in the 1950s and 60s, he looked at compassionate love as that love that we give and we're willing to lose something, so intensity of love, 
the extensity of love is that love that we're willing to give to anybody. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what they look like. It doesn't matter whether they're angry at you or not. You're still able to give that love. Pure love is the love that you give and you expect nothing in return. Adequate love is the love you give where that meets what the other person really needs. And then the fifth part is duration. And that's that giving of yourself, that energy of love to another person or group or something for a very long time. So when you take those five categories, you bring them into compassion then you're really doing something and you can measure it. Yes. And so this is the internal compassion energy that we talked about earlier on. Um, so for internal compassion energy data collection, we use a survey design. Uh, we used a convenient sample of adults 18 plus and we recruited from all 36 zip codes in the Louisville, Kentucky area so that we can have, a because all of our external data we collected on the zip code level, uh, you know, and there are 36 different zip codes in Louisville. So we literally had to go to so many places, making sure we have a representative sample from each of these zip codes. Um, we focus on, and we actually in the end were able to get enough from each of the zip codes uh, to, to have basic representation from the amount of individuals that live in the different zip codes. It took, it took us a long time. We had a VISTA student that helped us with this. Um, so, you know, Sometimes cities would say we don't have the time to do the internal compassion piece. We would recommend that you at least try and do it once to get a feel for your community and the people in the community. You can do it online. We, we, we did it before. We did an online one. We didn't get enough representation from all the areas. So we used some of our students to help us with that. So we actually went out. Yes, we, it, was a, it was actually a pretty robust survey. And uh, we decided to use zip codes because that was our smallest area of search that we could do and, and for comparison purposes within the city of Louisville. So this is literally, I am just gonna quickly take you through it to show you how we still not got 100% representation from every, every aspect of life that we wanted to. Um, so if you look here, we had, as usual, you get in surveys more females than males that participated in our study because if you look at the population of uh, Louisville it's 52 percent female but we had seven, 70 percent participation of females in our study. That's not bad for surveys because most of the time females are over 80 percent so it's not too bad but we, ha we were trying to get more males. Yes and what was interesting a funny fact that came up was I actually called some of my male friends and said, would you fill out the survey? And they said, no, we're not gonna fill out a compassion survey. That's too mushy, too hard to measure. And I said, but we're trying to measure it. And still they wouldn't fill it out. Yep. <laughs> so here we have our race ethnicity distribution of the 3,400 people we um, had surveys completed for. Again, we were a little bit more white than what we wanted it to be. Uh, but again, it's more diverse than anyone we, anything we did previously uh, that we only used the online methods. Uh, marital status, a little bit overrepresented on married and partnered individuals. Um, age, we were a little bit overrepresented on people between the age of 20 and 39. Um, but overall, our sample uh, was about 43 was the median age and the median age for the other group for the population is 38. Yeah, it's not too bad. And probably the reason why we had the younger students too is we had a lot of students helping us on this too. Yeah. 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 But we had a less, less, less than a 60 yes. plus population. Yes. Um, in terms of education, a little bit overrepresented with a, uh, people with a bachelor's degree or higher. Um, so that was a little bit of an issue for us. Uh, so it's your more educated people who take part in surveys and that's what we found with what we did as well. And then you know, probably more time, they have more time to do that too. Yeah. yeah. Employment status, uh, we did actually on this one very well. Uh, most of, you know, we had the same amount of people who were unemployed, not in labor force and in the labor force. So this one was okay. Um, and then income. Uh, a little bit overrepresented on the higher income group, also because I think of the 
education levels, it was a little bit higher. All of these are what you find in surveys most of the time, uh, but we were at least more diverse than uh, what you normally see in surveys. Uh, okay, the analysis method we used is the Alkair Foster methodology to look, and, and that's really based on multidimensional poverty measurement and analysis that was done by this group. And, and we did that, we really got that from the Gross National Happiness Index. Well, that's the method they that's use. That's the method they use. Yeah. That was very helpful to us. Right, right. So, the way it works is that with this analysis method, you first, of course, decide on what is your purpose, you know. So the purpose here was to monitor compassion. So we want to make sure we have something that can be replicated. Uh, so that's an important part of this, of, of this piece. Uh, we wanted to make our unit of analysis, as Joe said, as small as possible so that we can differentiate uh, areas in which compassion is not happening or where, uh, you know, internally and also where the government resources are not necessarily there. And this was, this was a good thing for us, but also a very difficult thing. Was, we, we went very, very small and it was difficult for us. Sometimes we were struggling to get the data on the zip code level, but we worked with the Census Bureau and they gave us a lot of good guidance on how to take data on a, on a bigger level and convert it to a zip code level. And we were able to do that for many of our indicators. Um, the dimensions, we already talked about the three dimensions. We had the basic human needs, foundations of well-being and opportunities. You have the number of indicators there, is, is there 11, 16, and six. The cutoff, so this is now the important methodology, you, you, you create a cutoff for each of these indicators, and basically we use the national average for everything. So if, the, if this is the national average, and you can get on the zip code level to be above the national average, then you are okay. If not, then you're not okay. Um, so we also decided on the values, what do you, what value do you give to each indicator? You know, do you say something is more valuable than another? Uh, there's a lot of research done on this. Is it good or bad to have differential weights? Uh, for our purposes here, we decided to use equal weights across the indicators. And that's just a valid judgment you make with discussion you have with community people to tell you, you know, is it more important to give, to get people out of poverty? Or is it more important to reduce crime? And the, the answer is, we don't really think you can make that differentiation. Everything is important. So that's why they weight the same. Then we uh, have a compassion standard cutoff. So you have, depending on how many indicators you have in your different categories, you decide on um, what, score you need to have to uh, have compassion. And then you identify the zip codes who are compassionate, and then you, you work with a formula to create a multidimensional compassion index score. Basically looking at, even within zip codes, are the areas that's a little bit more compassionate than others. Uh, and within these dimensions, that a zip code do slightly better on the one and the other, you can't completely say they're not compassionate. So um, those is the, that's the analysis method we use. Now let's, let's now, what we wanna do now is take you through some of the geo maps we drew based on the results of Louisville. And then talk a little bit as we go through each one of these maps about the value of this for city and for uh, the individuals living in Louisville, because what does this mean? Because if you think about it, we cannot say that cities are, uh, you know, 100% compassionate and they're also not 100% non-compassionate. And where are we on that spectrum? And what can we do to change things around? So, the first one we want to show you here is we were looking at, this is the city of Louisville. This is, this is basically our map. And just to give you a little bit of history, uh, Joe, just jump in here. Yeah, I will. Um, the western part of Louisville is traditionally seen as the more poorer areas of the city, the more ethnically, racially diverse communities. And then if you go to the east side, you see the healthier, more white communities. So if you look at your internal compassion energy to the left, you look at the map to the left, you see that uh, in only three zip codes, only three of the 36 zip codes, 8% of the zip codes, were we able to absolutely meet compassion standards in terms of internal compassion energy. 
So the, the multidimensional compassion index, that is a reflection of the incidence of compassion across zip codes, as well as the intensity of the compassion experience in these zip codes, received a score of 69%. So that means that we had in three zip codes, absolute great, wonderful compassion. We have overall the, the, the ability, the intensity of the compassion experience in these zip codes leads to an overall compassion score of 69%. So that means that internally, internally, that our community has compassion more than what we thought. If you compare that to the external compassion on the other side, we had compassion standard, even though we met the compassion standard in six out of the 36 counties. Zip codes. I mean, sorry, zip codes. The MCI, the multidimensional compassion index was only 36%. And the reason for that lies with that strong red band you see here in the West Louisville area. And that is the West. It's that's, the West, it's the West and, end, it's the more poorer areas. And, and that's the area that has the food deserts. It's the area. They don't have any grocery stores, crime right. is high. Yes, all of, all of that. And so something is not right with our city. If you look at, there is, but you see internally, you see that there's a lot of compassion internally. The people themselves. The people, the, the people themselves. The people themselves, there's a lot of internal compassion. But externally, the government's not doing a good job. And this has to do with the historical kind of things that we are basically addressing now with the city. What, it ha what happened historically that resulted in this kind of issue that we are facing here? We're trying to, to fix this. So this is great to show to the city on what's going on overall. This is like the overall map. Okay, so let's go to the next map. Um, so here you see the basic human needs. Uh, now, as we said before, you know, we looked at the basic human needs and we saw that here your, your, your multidimensional compassion index is 58% in terms of what the city is doing to meet your basic human needs. So, and you, you know, you'll notice by the legend that these are the zip codes, the colors are related to zip codes that we, or whether they're receiving sufficient resources or not. Right. Are they receiving this, the sufficient, sufficient resources and services to promote human flourishing? And again, you see that it happens most of the time in your richer areas. It's not happening so great in your, in your areas here. Uh, the, although there's one little community here in this one zip code where it actually going, okay, in terms of basic human needs. You take them to the other areas, nutrition, basic human, uh, that's the basic human need indicator. So we now take it even further. So the, you know, it's the summary of the basic human needs. Now you can break it up and say, where are you seeing issues? We see pockets of nutrition issues. If you look to the map at the top, we are seeing pockets of shelter issues where we don't have housing stability. We've got homelessness, um, people paying too much for housing, but look at our personal safety. That is a biggest problem we have right now in Louisville. There's a lot of crime. There's a lot of unnecessary traffic violations and traffic accidents. So those two combined is a problem with personal safety. We have the, we have the highest pedestrian deaths in, this, in the uh, country in Louisville. Uh, we have a very high crime rate as well in our inner city. And you see it's again, it's concentrated in the western part of the city. Yeah, and it doesn't mean that the city's not trying to do something. They're really aware of this. They really are trying to do something. But what this indicator does is it gives them a map to show them where these are the areas that we really should be concerned about. That you need to focus on, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Because some, some are okay, you know, on nutrition, but not on personal safety. Some are okay on shelter, but not on nutrition. You know, so these things, we need to look at everything and then find strategic ways in which to fix these problems. Now we get to the summary piece of foundations of well-being, and we see here that the score is 63%, uh, the multidimensional compassion index. So overall, the city is not doing too bad on foundations of well-being. Um, except for those three zip codes, three or four zip codes that's in the red. So what is these foundations of well-being? If you go deeper, you see, ooh, actually what's interesting is that 
access to basic knowledge is pretty pretty, pretty good pretty yellow yeah. so it's 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 not too bad uh well the yellow is uh, let me just go back for a minute yellow is yeah, yeah. it's the second best level see less is the second le less you're right and level. then you look at access to information communication within the city of Lugo, we've got really good internet uh resources fiber optics and all we kinds do, of stuff they're laying more fiber optics they're really sure. trying to and there's even communities that can access wireless anywhere where yes they, are. they so. actually have now chargers on the corners where you could charge your phones right on the corners of certain streets so yeah. so they have they have done a lot within the inner city of louisville to make that good environmental quality you see there is a little bit of a problem in some part but others are you know okay and, and this then, is historical also that so is. a lot of the factories and a lot of the chemical companies went into True. the poor regions of Louisville, that West End, yes. Rubber Town. There was different areas that were trying to recuperate. So there's a lot of brown fields in those areas. Right, right. Yeah. And in basic wellness opportunities, you see, again, you've got one zip code that's really doing bad in terms of basic wellness opportunities. And then you've got a spread across. But look at health and wellness. That's sort of our core problem. Health and wellness in the city of Louisville, again, is a very strong divide between the west and the east part. Joe, you used to say that if you drive from the one part of the yeah. town to the other part of the town... You, you die 13 years earlier. You die 13 years earlier if you live in just, western Louisville. Just traveling about 10 miles. Yeah. 10 miles difference between yeah. two areas creates a 13-year difference in life expectancy. Yeah. So lots of issues we need to work on in Louisville. Then the last one is the opportunities. Um, that's with the highest level of, of compassion where we uh, scored a 42% as a city. And um, if you go to the two areas is tolerance and inclusion. Uh, we are doing pretty good. Yeah, right. Access to advanced economic opportunities. We're not doing so good, specifically again in the Western part of our city. So what are our conclusions? Our conclusion that we are coming to based on this is that 36% is your multidimensional compassion index score for compassion. We have a supportive mayor, but we do have significant challenges we need to overcome. So we are already working with quite a few groups within the city of Louisville, trying to see what are we gonna do with this? How are we gonna announce this to the public to, and then figure out a strategic plan to work towards improving that multidimensional compassion index score for external compassion. Um, we believe it's possible. We're working with the city closely. We're working with a, res a resilience movement also in Louisville. We're calling ourselves Compassion 2.0 right now because we're really trying to now zone in on areas we can improve on. So I think one of the key factors that we have in Louisville is Mayor Greg Fisher is very much supportive. He is not afraid of the data. He wants to know. And as I said originally, he's infusing within the whole city uh, budget and within the whole city framework on how do you, how does the city do a better job? Right. And in the, in the city planning, there's specific strategies for that already yes. identified. Yes. The, what is really in our favor is that we have a lot of internal compassion energy to share. We have, we have a 69% score on our multidimensional compassion index for internal compassion. So we have a lot that we can share. And that means that there's a lot inside of our communities, even though they may be poor, even though they may be disadvantaged, there's a lot of energy right there. And that energy can be used to, to positively change their communities by advocating for change also on the city level if they don't get the resources they are required to get. And, you know, one of the examples we have is that one of our community groups advocated the um, city of Louisville for more trash cans in their area because there was trash lying around everywhere. And when they did their own little analysis, they saw that in certain parts of the city, there's a lot of trash cans on every corner. In their little community where they were living, there was almost none. And just doing that analysis and making sure that they are heard, they were able to fix that and get more trash cans and lead to a much better, healthier environment for them to live in.
So I think this, this speaks towards now we know what the strengths are in our community, we know what the weaknesses are in our community, and now we're working with the city to see what we need to do to fix it. And I think it's, it's, so, it's so important for us to, that we know that we have the support of the city. And then we have the people who were compassionate too, that showed through our in, in internal investigation that they are compassionate too. Yeah. That makes it, uh, so it's almost like a foundation for compassion. Exactly, the foundation is there. Now we just need to make it work. We need to make it happen. Right. So I think we are done with our formal presentation. I think it's now time for questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Joe and Anna. I, I just love how much energy and passion you bring to your work. We have a few questions that uh, have been coming in. I, are you able to see those questions or would you like me to uh, uh, read we, them? We actually can, uh, let's see if we can. Yeah, we can see the questions. Okay, so we're gonna start from the top. Uh, let's see. We have, how long did it take you to develop the index and, and how did you fund it? Uh, funding, we, we used compassion to fund our study. Yeah, we definitely used <laughs> compassion. It was very funny when we asked for money, everybody said, no, we don't have any money. <laughs> yeah, right. So we, we did not have the money. We used our own scholarship time to develop it. Uh, and it, in terms of the length of time it took, because it wasn't funded, it was one of those, you know, your project of love that has to always wait when any other thing comes in its way. So in order for us to do all this and develop it, it took us about two years, but now it's developed and now we have sort of the boilerplate done and we know what to do. And it's a much easier process in order to help other people as well. Wonderful. And how would you recommend that um, the folks on the call access data? So you, you showed a number of resources on how you collected the massive data sources. Are those available to the public? Do you have any international knowledge of access to data um, and how to begin plugging them into your index? Yes, I mean really the my in my background I have I have worked for almost 15 years with existing databases and it really is just a skill of, of searching what is available and try to find resources that is publicly available. Because, you know, if you have to go to people, who, we, we, were, we were debating if we're gonna add data, for example, from our school system into this index. We decided against it because it's very difficult to get hold of that data. Not many cities do gather the level of data that our school system gathers. So we decided no on that. Um, uh, in essence, what I can say is it takes a little bit of a skill to, to know what is available and to search for it, but there's a lot of support online in order to find what is available. Even also international, the World Health Organization has a lot of data that is available via them. Um, it's a matter of just finding the places that can provide the answers for you and and you know, this is the goal of this webinar is to tell people we're available to help if you don't know where to find what you need in terms of data. Yeah. So let me ask you a question, Anna. So from your experience in South Africa, what data sources, for example, in South Africa will you, would you be able to get? South Africa has a lot of these uh, data resources as well. You, you just have to, sometimes the data is not stored in an, in, in an online environment. I, used, I did a study in the early 2000s on existing data in South Africa, similar kind of stuff I was looking at. And uh, I just had to work with the government departments myself, in the, you know, more directly to get the data that I needed. Yeah, and I, I know that what, one recommendation I have uh, in collecting data when you're calling, for example, calling the police department. I had to call different numbers before I finally found someone who understood, even the health department. I had to call the health department looking for data. I had to fill out forms and certain procedures you have to follow. So perseverance is probably the most important thing. Having people that are dedicated to this, I think is also very important. Right, right. And, and um, I just want to make it to me, someone was asking you a question related to the health of the environment of the city in terms of well-being, and they had examples here of green spaces, recycling and composting in public building programs, alternative energy sources, solar wind. 
What I want to say is that if you look at that, all of those are excellent indicators of the environment. And as you remember, we have tree canopy in one of us, and we have the, uh, you know, in our indicator, we have the quality of the air. The reason why we, and this, this is now going to sound crazy, uh, the, the reason why we do not have a lot of alternative energy sources that we looked at is because we have nothing in Louisville. That's literally the reality. So for us to measure something that doesn't exist, what, didn't make any sense. But for another community where there are alternative energy sources that's being used uh, in some more than others, that's an excellent in indicator for that one, you know, how, how uh, good your environment is. So that speaks towards how important it is to personalize this to your city and to your environment. Very much so, yes. Okay, we have another question for you. Um, do you see this impacting policy or um, ways to uh, utilize this data to address inequities across the zip codes? And we also have a question about how to apply this to towns or, or different boundaries, if you will. Right, right. Yes, let me say something about the uh, policy piece. That's the whole goal. The, that the that's the core focus of what we're doing in Louisville is to change policy. We have been able to engage the city now in terms of the planning that they do is to always look at the things that we are talking about, that we are looking at, um, and then move to other things that are important as well. The inequities that's going on in our city, we are addressing with storyboards. We are going out, we're getting community groups to come together. We're going to have a big unveiling of a, a so-called storyboard in the West Louisville, where we're going to discuss the historical inequalities and talk about how important it is to address it. So that we, because we, we cannot claim compassion if our West, part of Louisville looks the way it looks. So yes, policies is a core part of what we're doing. That was the one question. And the other one was, yes, zip codes is the smallest level that we went. Uh, we are currently working on, uh, we're actually looking uh, at all the cities that in the states that has declared themselves as compassionate and want to do a comparative analysis between cities. So then your cities becomes your unit of analysis. And we look at data that we can have by city. You can also do analysis by counties. You can do analysis by states. You can by do towns, analysis by countries. It doesn't matter. It's what you, you, you choose your unit of analysis and you work from there. Yeah, and I, I think that that's a key too, is that what took a lot of times was us converting data that was not on a zip code level. So keep that in mind too, when you're doing research, is looking at what's available, what's easy to do, what's fast to do, versus having to make a lot of uh, yeah, we, 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 needed, we needed this data on the zip code level because when we were trying originally to look at compassion and we were more holistic and we were looking at the city as a general, uh, in, in general, we got a lot of negativity from the western part of Louisville who said, you're going to just average us out again and no one will know what's going on in our communities. Sure. And that is why we went to the zip code level. So it, it's going to depend on uh, where you are and what are the specific needs for what you're trying to accomplish. That will determine what is the level at which you're going to do it. I want to make one comment about someone said here that this data is already skewed for Louisville being a compassionate city. You know, I mean, there's a lot to say about if you, 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 you voice it out in the universe, you are compassionate. But if you look at our data, I don't think we're that compassionate. I honestly don't think so. I think we need to do a lot more work. And now we can do targeted work. Yes, our mayor can go and claim we are a compassionate environment, but it's because he's trying at least to do something. He's not ignoring the fact that there's a lot of disparities in our community. He's trying to address it. But we are definitely not there. Yes, and, and you know, and, and I, I think it's important to know that Anna and I give a lot of speeches. We're out in the community, and a lot of times people don't even want it. They, they don't even want to hear us talk because they think it's a bunch. You know, uh, uh, it's it's not really valid to say we're compassionate when we have such disparities within the city. But I agree with what Anna said. You've got to put it out there. You claim that you are a compassionate city, and then you'll become it. Yeah. It's like you have to build the field, and then the players will come. Yeah. Well, this is wonderful, Anna and Joe. I, I'm just thrilled that this index is now available. We've had a number of questions come through asking about how to begin using the Compassion Index and what are the next steps for their cities uh, to create a Compassion Index. Um, so I think that you know, next steps would be an important 
um, piece to talk about, as well as if you can comment on influencers. In other words, do you need the, the city mayor to uh, endorse this, or are there other entities, foundations, social service agencies, others who may see value in this? How would you recommend the next steps, unless you'd like uh, someone from the Human Value Center to jump in, I'm gonna mute and let you respond. Well, for, first of all, I wanna say, you don't necessarily need the, the top, you don't, need, you, you don't need the mayor, but you would like to have the mayor because you want the movers and shakers who can change policies at your table. Uh, but in order to measure what you need, what Joe and I did is we literally went, we measured internal compassion and we made an appointment with the mayor and we showed him our data and they said, don't you think you need to know this for your whole, for your whole city? Um, so it's persuasive, just going out there and, and doing what you need to do. But if you feel that you don't have a supportive top government official, I would work with any organization in your community that's a mover and shaker to make it happen. That's correct. Yeah, I think even just companies, it doesn't even matter. Once again, it gets back to energy. So once that compassion energy is ignited, it then begins to flow outward. Yeah. So within Louisville, we have compassion groups meeting. We have great people that are working on compassion in Louisville that it all emanated from that one step that the mayor took in 2011, signing the compassion charter. Yes. And I, I think that one of the things that can really help is working with the Human Value Center. Yes. And I, I think that that's, and I think Laura, you, you could address that. Yeah, because I think what we try to create here is a platform for support, you know, where we can, for example, the question is asked here, can we have the instrument with the survey for the internal compassion? Yes, you can. Um, is there a way you can help us identify what are the important people we need to work with? Yes, we can help you. What would be the best indicators to use? What's the best uh, unit of analysis? That's where we are at. We are here to help and the charter and the- Yes. And the Human Value Center. And, and the Human Value Center have some thoughts on that. We well. really believe that this needs to be across the globe. People need to begin to not just say they're compassionate, not just throw that, that, that money in the basket, but actually figure out how both we as, as, as citizens and how governments can work together to form a com compassionate communities. And there will be pushback. There's no doubt about it. There will be pushback. There are a lot of naysayers, but I think that we just keep moving forward. I know Anna and I are committed to this. We just keep moving forward and the Compassion Charter and Human Value Center, we have all of the foundation that's available to really help promote this. Your energy is absolutely contagious. I can feel it through this screen. Thank you so much for your presentation. I will say to uh, those who have signed on for this webinar, um, we support the Charter for Compassion. The Charter for Compassion supports compassionate cities. So it is a collective collaborative effort and the energy that everyone brings will bring this so that all people can flourish. I would recommend for those of you um, who would like to get started utilizing the index, we have uh, the Compassion Index uh, information on the Human Value Center website um, to, to uh, you know, contact us and we can begin the steps to make that available. Anna and Joe will also be at the Compassionate Cities Leadership Institute that will be hosted in Phoenix, Arizona, March 15th through 17th. If you would like to come and do a hands-on deeper dive into shaping your next steps for compassion in your community, come and join us in Phoenix. Um, but let's keep this conversation alive. I know Marilyn um, Turkovich, who can't speak now, but our executive director at the Charter has been working tirelessly to find more and more tools for compassionate cities to be successful. Having metrics enables us to manage what we measure. When we combine this with our existing values assessment tools, we can then compare and, and, and look at all of the many layers that goes into this. So, um, you know, we, we've looked at everything as um, an equal indicator, but some communities will say one indicator or, or one measure is more important than the other because that reflects the values of the members of the community. So we're creating more and more holistic assessment and analytical tools um, to understand how compassion really is changing our society. So we thank everyone for their participation. We hope that we can keep this information alive. I'm seeing questions about thank you so much and how can we contact you. 
Anna and Joe, um, if you would like to let the group know the best way to contact you. Otherwise, folks, there is a, um, a contact form on the Human Value Center website if you want to send in specific contact information and questions. Um, we will certainly do our best to help you. The Human Value Center website is humanvaluecenter.org. Yeah, I think that'll be the best. Via you all connect with us and then we can connect with them and we can work it that way. Uh, I think on the website, uh, our contact information is also on there. Laura, we can't hear you. I said, thank you, everyone. Please have a wonderful day. And may we all flourish. And let's um, share this. I'm getting some questions about the recording. This has been recorded. So we'll be happy to make that available. Joe and Anna, I have some questions about will your slides be available? Yes. Yes, we can send it to you, Laura, and then you can post it on the side. Is that OK? Very good. We will make these available um, on the website for humanvaluecenter.org. And uh, we will share that with the Charter for Compassion as well. So that can be part of the Compassionate Cities toolbox. Thank you, everyone. And let's keep the conversation alive. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you.